I'm here today to tell you two stories from Syria. Um, we will use fake names to protect people. But we, let's uh, first watch this video first. And luckily, he's alive. The first story is uh, about uh, Dr. X, who is uh, a doctor my age. When the revolution started in Syria in 2011, he chose to treat protesters and ordinary civilians caught in the crossfire. He went on to manage one of the field hospitals there. It was bombed and shelled every day. Once we were together in Turkey, and I remember him telling me he can't wait to go back to Syria. I asked him, what do you mean exactly? He said, you know, once anyone tastes the sweetness of saving lives and helping others, he becomes addicted to it. He can't stop. Dr. X treated patients and people attacked by chemical weapons. He traveled a lot to Europe, the US, and many countries to speak about what's going on in Syria. And yet, he can't wait to come back to his hospital in Syria, even when it's raining barrel bombs. There are hundreds of Dr. X doctors, nurses, midwives, paramedics. The second story is about Mr. S. He's with the white helmets, our heroes. A volunteer member in the civil defense, he works in the besieged areas near the capital, Damascus. One night, women and children were sheltering in basements and airstrikes attack happened. The civil defense teams moved to the area. A member of the team, Mr. S, discovered that it was his own home attacked, but he risked his own family. Yet, this is not a father risking his own family. This is a heroic volunteer risking his own family, a family. What, does, what do these stories has, have in common? Actually, no money can push anyone to do these actions unless they believed in the goal so much that they would have done it anyway. Some institutions, they, would have, they, they wouldn't replace volunteers with paid workers, uh, with paid staff, even if they had the money to do so. Why? Because volunteers provide a service 
which is qualitatively different. They create a positive atmosphere, an irreplaceable environment. They have a social impact which is far greater than, of that, than, uh, than those of who are paid. A 2009 study investigated the impact of volunteers on recipients. They found that recipients can differentiate between the services given by volunteers and paid staff. Actually, recipients perceive the volunteers as amazing people who really care for them, who show them that good exists in the world. They even inspire recipients to become volunteers themselves. So volunteerism is critical, is irreplaceable in every healthy community, city, or nation. But the power of volunteerism is much greater than that on a global scale. Researchers from the Johns Hopkins Center for Civilian Society Studies found that approximately 140 million people in 37 countries engage in volunteer work in a typical year. If those 140 million volunteers comprise the population of a country, it will be the ninth largest country in the world. Those 140 million volunteers will represent equivalent of 20.8 uh, million full-time jobs, contributing around $400 billion to the global economy annually. So the community of volunteers can form a critical and powerful force, a stakeholder that has a huge influence that can rival and balance the world's great powers. Therefore, when you volunteer, you are part of this international community of volunteers. Remember this. If UN fails, the international community of volunteers can step in. If your government fails, it's time for the immense power of volunteers to take action. As member of the global community of volunteers, you are doing three amazing, or actually you are accomplish, accomplishing three amazing things. You are doing what's needed immediately, avoiding the bureaucracy of those who are paid to do that. You are sending messages to donors and stakeholders that there is someone who is doing the job more smoothly. So you are creating a positive competition that encouraged, encouraged the, the governmental organizations and companies to improve their performances. And, the most, and more importantly, you create a pressure on decision makers in governments, non-governmental organizations, and UN agencies. Those decision makers have to contend with many stakeholders, including lobbyists, businesses, arm industry, and more. We criticize them because they are unable to act. When the actions they need to take seem so obvious, why should we leave to those who represent us in the government or UN agencies to fight all these battles? Actually, in fact, their power is very limited. The community of volunteers, which can't be bought by money or influence or swayed by politics or alliances, can always support vocally the decisions that make our world a better place. So don't 
so let us don't just criticize a president that he doesn't believe in climate change. Or, uh, and he is building walls between his nation and the other nations. And he wants to arm teachers. Um, I'm saying this as someone who was blocked from entering the United States and completing my studies at Brown University because of, because of the travel ban there. But I was lucky that there were volunteers who advocated for me. There were volunteers that actually sponsored me. And UFT welcomed me with open arms. And that's why I'm here now. So let's build bridges inside our communities so we can drive and support our decision makers to take and to do the right thing and build more bridges between us and all the other nations so we can solve more problems all over the world. When I talk to the amazing volunteers in the field in Syria, we argue, does it really take a crisis, a shock, a painful picture or video to wake us up from our daily lives? Why? We know that there are horrible things going in the world, in different places in the world. Why do we still do nothing to stop them? Why you avoid these stories in the newspaper? Why you change the TV channel when it comes to these stories? You know why? Because they give you the feeling of helplessness. However, if everyone does something, everyone acts in his or her own small way, we can and we will make a huge difference. Let me give you an example. At the lowest point in the war in Syria, when the shelling was horrible, like what's happening now in Eastern Ghouta, as you know, volunteers from all over the world, especially from Europe and North America, they started to send and to post uh, messages through social media, actually by taking selfies and pictures with a whiteboard or paper with the message of solidarity with those people under the barrel bombs in Syria. And they shared all these photos in one hour over the weekend in a tweet storm with one hashtag so the people in Syria can see it and they can attract actually more volunteers. Through the next weekend, th through the next week, people in Syria were so encouraged to receive a huge number of messages through, through the social media from all over the world. So they decided to respond in the same way. Actually, some messages, as you see, went directly to some individual, some, like a specific group, and it went back and forth every week for a couple of weeks. And it became more creative every week. Actually, for some volunteers who even didn't know where Syria is before, in a couple of weeks, they knew faces, names, and stories of Syrians in the war zone in Syria. You can imagine the encouragement and hope it gave to those people in Syria when they knew that there were a lot of people all around the world who cared. These small actions encouraged them to do more. So now the bigger group decided to take this action a step forward, actually to deliver something else. So they decided to raise money to protect a hospital in Syria because they see the needs through the messages. We raised more than $200,000 in a couple of weeks 
from more than 3,000 individual donors from almost 80 countries. Now, you might say, the problems are so huge, and uh, there is no way that I can do anything significant. I don't have the power, resources, not even time. This is helpless thinking. Instead, try this. Think in volunteering as something we need, we, we all must do if we want to live and thrive in this society. Put it in your agenda as your meetings, businesses, trips, holidays. Specify two hours of your time every week to explore and search for volunteering opportunities. And believe me, in a couple of weeks, you will say, hey, I can join this group who are taking, who, who's taking care of those who are less fortunate. I can do something local and small for the environment. I can join this protest for the people in Syria or somewhere else. I can help this group in this poor country to develop a mobile application so they can reach more children with food and vaccines. I can support those lawyers in one of the human rights groups. I can always participate in the social media advocacy campaigns. And as Dr. said, uh, and as Dr. X, you will be, uh, before you know, you will be hooked on helping others. And there's more. When you share your experience on the social media, people stop saying, I don't understand what's going on. I don't know how to help. Actually, they will learn what's going on. They will see how they can help because you show them the way. Think back to Dr. X and the stories that I told you at the beginning of this talk. The only difference between you and all these people are, is their circumstances. They are in a war zone, and you are not. But there is nothing inside you that makes you any less capable to do the, th the same things that they do every day. And like Dr. X said, there is nothing sweeter than volunteering.